So welcome everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us at the ILS ANU International Law Society's last um, event of semester one, 2023. Um, today we have with us two incredible ANU College of Law um, scholars and academics. We have Tina and we have Anton. Um, and we have intentionally chosen to invite um, both of them because of their connection with students and how um, popular they are among the courses that they teach and they teach um, in different capacities, some of the most important courses delivered at the College of Law. And I thought, um, um, and, and the community thought that it's going to be such an incredible opportunity um, for um, both of you to come and speak to our students um, and share more about your research work and, and other professional things that you've um, done in the past because they're very, very exciting and we're very, very lucky at the college to have you with us. So thank you so much once again for making time. Um, I will begin by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land um, um, on the lands that all of us are on. Um, I think it's all for us, uh, Canberra, the Anunwal and Nambri people, and we um, pay deep respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and we will begin this discussion and Charlotte, um, our careers director, um, will take over soon. Uh, my name is Shashwat, I am the president. We have Aubrey, who is the treasurer. Um, and we have a Nin who's going to be joining us with a wise president. Um, and this is going to be a small, intimate uh, chat. We're not expecting a massive audience. And we are very keen to get to know um, about your um, journeys and your work. And Charlotte, I'm going to hand it to you now. Okay, great. Thank you, Shashwa. Um, so again, welcome to our speakers, um, Tina and Anton. Um, tonight we want to highlight and discuss different issues in international law and allow students access to your expert opinions and experiences. Um, let me first introduce our first panelist, Dr. Tina Tuvala. Um, her work focuses on the political economy, history and theory of international law. She's especially interested in historical materialism, deconstruction, feminist and queer legal theory. She is currently an associate professor at the ANU College of Law and has many recent publications on international law, such as Capitalism as Civilization, a History of International Law. Our second panelist, Dr. Anton Moshenko, has work that focuses on transnational crime, economic crime, and cybercrime, as well as legal and policy aspects of targeted sanctions. He is the author of Corruption and Targeted Sanctions, a monograph on the legal and policy implications of Magnitsky laws. He is currently a lecturer at the Australian National University and has worked on many projects across Australia and the UK. Um, now that our, our panelists have been introduced, let's get started with the questions. Um, so um, our first question, we'll start with Tina, if that's all, yeah. Um, you are both very accomplished in your field. What drew you to a career in international law? Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Charlotte. Thanks for the opportunity to chat both with the three of you and, of course, with, with Anton. Um, interestingly enough, in my undergrad, I was not especially interested in international law. International law courses were compulsory. Um, I did my degree in Athens, so I did take them whether I wanted or not. I did okay. Uh, I wouldn't say I particularly excelled um, in them or I had a great interest. My interest in international law arose basically when I decided to go overseas um, for a master's degree for further study. And even though Greece is a civil law system, I went to the UK, which has a common law system. So it felt a little bit counterintuitive um, studying public law, which was at that stage my preferred um, field of study. So I thought, well, you know, public law, public international law, I, somewhat naively, <laughs> I assumed um, that it wouldn't be too much of a difference. Of course, it is <laughs> a lot of difference. Um, but I really enjoyed basically studying for my master's and I discovered that international law in the UK, but also in, in Australia to a large extent, to many in many Anglophone countries, um, as an academic field of study has a certain 
openness and a certain pluralism. And there was space for me to explore ideas and theories that I cared about, that I found very interesting. I found very compelling in how they explain the world. I had the opportunity to engage with these theories as an academic um, endeavor. And that was to me, um, I have to say a revelation, the idea that, you know, I could read and write for a reading, for a living. Um, and I could read and write both law books, but perhaps also theory books, um, was truly, it, it sounded amazing. Um, and that's roughly um, how I got into it. I did a master's in international law around 2011. Um, and then I decided to pursue a PhD and this is somehow. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is my one doesn't need, and that doesn't only apply to international law, but one doesn't need to necessarily be able to trace an interest all the way back to their school years. You know, there's these people who are like, as a student, I did like a model UN, I excelled at university in international law. There are people who are like that, but there are also people who discover their passion further um, down the road. So in a sense, I just want to encourage all a and &E students um, to perhaps not be too knowing and be open in the possibility that this might be something that interests them or not. Uh, so I think I'll conclude with that. Yeah, Charlotte, do you want me to jump in? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Sorry, I think mine oh, glitched for a second. It was a bit of a delay. Thank no, you that, that. that's fine. And and thank you so much, Charlotte, and the rest of the team for having me alongside Dina. Um, look, like Dina, I'm a transplant from a foreign legal system, but my journey is somewhat different. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Kiev National University in Ukraine, but rather unusually, my undergraduate program specialized in public international law. Um, so if you ask me anything about Ukrainian law, I will stare at you with a, a blank uh, face and a lack of, of comprehension. Now, the reason why they have that uh, program up until now is a bit of a dark uh, history, uh, because um, as some of you might know, uh, Ukraine alongside Belarus and Russia was one of the founding members of the UN. And that is not because of any particular autonomy that was granted to them, but because Stalin negotiated for that to get three votes instead of one in the UN. And that meant, among other things, that Ukraine had its own Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it needed experts in international law. And some of them were educated in Moscow, but not all of them. And that model persists up until now, which is why they have that bespoke program in international law. But then when I went to the UK to continue my education, I drifted away from international law and I became interested in the law of financial crime, which uh, felt like a nascent area that didn't have too much too many experts in it and definitely not much by way of academic research. And so since then, my work has been primarily issue oriented. Um, I don't I wouldn't necessarily say that I specialize in public international law or criminal law or financial regulation. But I do work at the intersection of all those areas in the context of economic crime, anti-financial crime regulation, and indeed economic sanctions. But I continue to work uh, to a significant extent in areas related to public international law simply because they matter so much. And we feel that sometimes without knowing in our daily lives. So when we go to a bank and open a bank account, um, we're going to be asked some questions about who we are. And where do we get our money from? And if you do something suspicious, you're going to be reported to the authorities. And none of that is an Australian invention or, or even an American or British invention. It is something that comes from the international standards that are partly found in international conventions, like the one on corruption or transnational organized crime, and partly from soft law standards. And so my research is, in a sense, a, a response to the issues that are important in the area that I'm interested in, 
and quite a lot of them do boil down to public international law, which I think is really heartening to know for you know anyone who's interested in international law, but feels that it's really difficult to find those points of intersection with the quote unquote real world. I think that's simply not the case. Okay, great. Thank you, Anton, for that. Um, both revealed a lot about like how, your, how you came into your field, international law, and showed us that it's not just a straight, like in, you know, undergraduate, you're just like, let's go, <laughs> you know. Um, so our next question is, what would you say is the current most relevant issue in your respective field within international law, as you both do you have very different fields as well as some overlaps? Thank you. Can I, do you want me to go first? Um, yeah, that'd be great, sorry. Sure. I think, interestingly enough, actually, our very different interests have converged. I don't want to speak on Anton's behalf, but we've been discussing lately. Um, so I do think for me, the main question on a broad level is how international law and international institutions will respond to and whether they will be able to adapt to a new era of geopolitical competition and potentially um, economic disaggregation or perhaps you know, economic rearrangement, right? So we see, for example, um, that the golden era of international trade law where all major economies submitted their trade disputes uh, to the World Trade Organization has now ended. We also see a more close interconnection between trade and the economy in general and security. Right. So the typical example here is the U.S. effort um, to control the circulation of semiconductors, of chips, uh, and making sure that China doesn't get a technological edge. And we also see the increased use of economic sanctions, um, again, by all the major players in international law in order to enforce either international law or their own idea of their national interest. And I would say all these three um, trends put quite a bit of pressure uh, on the international legal order as it had been shaped the past 30 years. And what personally interests me a lot in this context is um, the very unique power um, that the popularity of the US dollar as an international currency gives to the United States to semi-unilaterally determine the rules of international law in some areas, including um, sanctions, right? And we see, for example, that Russia's choice, which is not exactly a choice, to keep um, reserves uh, in dollars in U.S. banks made them vulnerable to economic sanctions, of course, in response to Russia's illegal invasion um, of Ukraine. So I'm very interested to, to summarize um, in how economic power and international law will intersect in the 21st century, especially especially in light of the transition from a more unipolar world as we had in the 90s to a more multipolar world um, determined by competition rather than by the power of one uh, state. Hey, great. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Charles. No, no worries. And if you want to go ahead with your response, Ed. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that Dina mentioned sanctions. I suppose we converged in in this sort of field of uh, shared interests coming from very different angles and being on very different trajectories. Um, and my work in in this field began primarily with looking at the intersection of sanctions and international law on the one hand, and criminal justice on the other hand. So we've seen a trend 
over the past decade, I would say, beginning properly in 2012, although some sprouts of that had been bursting forth even before, of imposing sanctions on people who are allegedly involved in corruption and human rights abuse. And that raises some profound human rights issues. And just to give you a bit of context, why would states impose those sanctions? It's because when we open any news website, we uh, come across disturbing accounts of corruption or human rights abuse or other misconduct in certain parts of the world where there's not realistically going to be any accountability for the rulers of those countries, yet they tend to um, move their wealth to countries like the US, European countries, the UK, Australia, Canada, and others, and there they enjoy the proceeds of their activities while they're shielded from law enforcement in their countries of origin. So what should be the response of those destination states, for lack of a better term? And one answer that has been given to that is, well, why don't you use extrajudicial measures, something that is done by governments rather than courts, to freeze the assets of those suspected perpetrators of corruption and human rights abuse and deny them entry? Why don't you impose asset freezes and travel bans? And that obviously raises uh, fundamental questions about the need to fight impunity on the one hand and making sure that you're not seen as an attractive destination for dirty money, but on the other hand, respecting the human rights of, people's on, of people on the receiving end of those sanctions. And what has happened in the past couple of years is that that model has been continuously expanded. So now we have cybercrime related sanctions in uh, the EU and the US. And indeed, there is a framework for doing that in Australia as well. We have drug trafficking related sanctions in uh, the US again. Um, and of course, we have a huge swathe of sanctions regimes that are political in nature and um, are enacted in response to wrongdoing, such as Russia's aggression in Ukraine or human rights abuse in various countries. And so that starting point then got me thinking about the state on state aspects of sanctions as well, and the much broader array of different sanctions measures that have been imposed by some states and the legal issues that pertain to that. There are a couple of other areas of interest in, in international law um, as well that I've, I've started pursuing over the past couple of years that relate to my work. And just very briefly, I would mention another, which is compliance with international anti-corruption and anti-financial crime standards. And there is no quicker way to anger an international lawyer than to say the word compliance and sort of point out the lack of it in some areas of international law. But in the context of financial crime, we've got some interesting examples of things working uh, for instance, the technically non-binding recommendations of an organization known as the Financial Action Task Force. I mean, states are genuinely terrified of being blacklisted for a number of reasons. And so one of the interesting questions there is how can we take that recipe or can we take that recipe and use it in the context of binding international treaties or maybe international treaties going beyond the domain of financial crime and anti-corruption. What is happening there that tells us something about what makes states tick and makes them comply with international law? So that's another area that um, I think is probably worthy of, of studying something that I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around. Great, thank you both for those very in-depth and very like thoughtful answers. Um, for the next question, um, we would love to know a bit more about your publications as you both have um, multiple publications. Um, How do you go about writing them and what issues did you discuss? And we can start with uh, Tina. Right, that's an interesting um, question. Um, so I think there is two types uh, of stuff that I have written in the past. There is things that I have written that don't necessarily respond um, to some immediate discussion in international law, like the ones we were having just now with Anton. There is things that at some point, it feels I'm the only person in the world who cares about them. Uh, and there is publications that are much more 
topical and they respond to more current events or to things that are controversial under either in international politics and they have a law dimension or within international law primarily so right so i would say these two um types of publications require different form so i would say if there is a very intricate thing that only you care about perhaps a book or something longer or a longer article that perhaps you're writing over many years um, is the appropriate form because for example for me that can um, involve a lot of theory so it can involve a lot of reading and a lot of trying to explain to an audience that doesn't need to know the same theories to explain these theories and why they're relevant to international law and then there is publications either in a form of full articles so let's say 12,000 words 15,000 words or in the form of even blog posts, so like 1,500 words, um, that I tend to write in a more disciplined way with an eye to, um, yes, as I said, contemporary events and making sure that, you know, strike while the iron um, is, is still hot. So to give you a sense in one way or another, I was writing my book between 2012, which is when I started the PhD that formed the basis of it, and 2020. <laughs> so I finished my PhD in 2016, but I continued to work on it um, for a long time. And there is also blog posts that I wrote within a, one afternoon because I was very angry <laughs> about something and I wanted to say something urgently um, to my fellow um, colleagues. And I think in a sense there is and there should be space for both. And I think ideally academics should be able, not only academics, generally I would say people who write scholarly articles on law, which you can do even when if you're practitioners, I think there is value in both approaches and there is value in being able to combine them, in being able to think slowly and conceptually and fast and more, let's say, politically or more like policy um, oriented. And of course, then also different avenues are more appropriate for these two um, different genres. I guess what I'm trying to say of a more broad um, resonance, perhaps, to, to our audience is that one doesn't need to commit oneself to a very particular approach to international law. One doesn't need to be only a policy person or only a doctrine person or only, let's say, a critical theory person. I think there is a time and a place uh, for different modes of writing and different ways of intervening in the world. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your thoughts on how you went about that and um, your different types of publications that you like to do. Um, and if Anton would like to answer the question. Well, remarkably similar. I, I thought about my publications in exactly the same way. There's something that interests you and something more conceptual and reflective. And then there is something that um, I sometimes call uh, demand-driven publications, where you feel that there is a space for that in the world and uh, that there's a way for you to share your views and be useful. But I think that with even with those demand-driven publications, there are probably a number of different ways in which you can go about them. So sometimes your priority would be to take a step back and reflect on current developments and maybe uh, put them in a broader context or identify some interesting trend that you think hasn't been fully teased out by others. And so um, you, you you take a, a, a perspective of someone who's sort of sitting on top of a hill 
and looking at what you know people who actually do things are, are working on and you sort of reflect on that and you know maybe you say something that is useful to them but it's it's a mode of academic reflection i suppose i would say even though it it is based on current developments and then there are other publications where you actually try to directly contribute to the work of people involved in a particular area where in a sense the primary question you'd be asking yourself is am i being useful and if i write these 10 pages are they worth the time of someone who works in a particular organization and is at the coal face of the issues that i'm writing at am i actually contributing something that is of direct practical relevance and i think an extreme example of that uh, well, extreme not in a in a in a bad way, but just uh, a, a very clear cut example of that would be to write something that is not actually an academic publication at all, but is, for example, a submission to a parliamentary inquiry or a submission to a governmental call um, relating to a consultation. And this is something that a lot of academics do. And one of the benefits of that sort of uh, publication slash engagement is that that tends to create contacts and bridges between you and the industry, the profession, the government. And one of the advantages of that is talking to those people at the coal face and also learning from them, which is a research method that in, in some ways is unparalleled because that gives you some insight into what is happening right here and right now. And it's not mediated by you know the peer reviewed stuff that will be out in two years time after something's happened. Um, so th there's a whole spectrum of different publications and approaches to that. But I think, you know, fundamentally, as Dina said, it's somewhere on that range between the conceptual and the practical. Great. Thank you for both those answers. It seems that you guys are very in sync tonight <laughs> as well with <laughs> talking about the issues beforehand as well, which we love. We um, share a corridor and I feel, <laughs> you know, ideas marinate and move across the the corridor, perhaps. It's the official <laughs> corridor position. Um, so for our next question, um, you have both worked with the UN in some capacity. Um, how, like, has your work there revealed anything new about international law? Um, yeah, if Valentina starts, sorry. Yes, just to to explain to uh, those listening, I am um, a, a legal advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. What special rapporteurs are is independent experts. So it, the Right to Food one is Professor Michael Fakhri from the University of Oregon in the United States who um, are given basically authority from um, the UN to provide, to, to um, report basically on certain issues that are considered of particular relevance um, to, to the organization. Um, and it has been a very, I mean, obviously it's, it's, a non-paid position in which you help someone who's also in a non-paid position. So some, one thing I have learned is that there is no money in the UN. <laughs> that, <laughs> and that is a very interesting thing to know, right? That unlike some international organizations where um, there is perhaps sufficient funds, the most high profile, at least if you're a student international organization, is running on an extremely tight budget and it has been doing so I would say since the 1980s um, and that's an interesting thing to know right um, that a lot of people are, pay, are putting in a lot of unpaid work the second thing I learned it just confirmed something that I always tell my students but it confirmed it in a magnified way I always tell my students law is about reading and about writing, nothing more fancy, but it's about reading and writing in a particular way. It's a genre, legal writing, it's a genre, the way that poetry is a genre and um, um, weird fiction is a genre and romantic fiction is a genre, right? It has its conventions, it has its style, it has its audience. 
but even within legal writing and even let's say within international law writing different institutions have their own style so i would help the rapporteur to draft a report and then before even the report reaching the UN General Assembly um, and the member states, um, the Secretariat in Geneva would actually intervene and say, oh, you know, usually we don't use this word to describe this because these states will get extremely jumpy if they see this word because they are associated with X and X is something that had not crossed my mind uh, when <laughs> I was writing this word. So you, you start learning that even if you're relatively proficient in the language of international law on an abstract level, you have to learn the language of the particular institution. And by the way, that wasn't even because we are reporting to the General Assembly. If you're writing to the UN Security Council, there is, again, different variations of the language, different dialects, let's say, um, that you have to follow. And that's both frustrating in the sense that you're like, oh, I thought I have mastered this language and now you're telling me it has a hundred dialects. Um, but there is also something empowering and liberating and almost democratic because you're like, okay, this is not an innate talent or something that you either got or you don't got. It's a language that you can learn, right? And each and every one of us should have the ability to learn this language. And even if you're not the child of a diplomat, the same way I'm not a native English speaker, uh, I'm not native in this language, but I brought myself into it. So I think there is um, something frustrating, but I think hopefully it can also encourage more people to get into this field, even if they don't come from a native, uh, a, a native family, if that makes any sense. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, it sounds very technical, but thank you for the encouragement for any viewers. <laughs> um, um, Anton, would you like to go ahead with your answer? Uh, thank you. So my involvement with the UN, and I mean, it even sounds too, too grand to utter those words, is much more peripheral. So um, I've done some work for, for an organization that is called the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative, which is a baby of two parents, one of which is the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. And that is a Vienna-based agency that, as the name suggests, deals with drugs and crime under the auspices of the UN. And the second parent is the World Bank in DC. And so the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative is also based in DC. And uh, what the organization does is a broad range of, they cover a broad range of technical matters uh, uh, related to anti-financial crime and uh, corruption. And um, I've got the experience of interacting with the bunch of other international organizations in in this area and I suppose the headline is that uh, that really is the opposite end of the spectrum from the big picture political stuff that that makes the headlines so some of the work that I've done for you know another international organization so not the stolen asset recovery initiative was uh, looking at a methodology for the assessment of money laundering and terrorist financing risks related to virtual currency exchanges, you know, barely gets more technical than that. And it's a very dense, very long document that gets drafted by very overworked people. And that gets rolled out across a number of countries. And, you know, how do you identify the countries that you should prioritize? Well, that's an exercise in and of itself. And so the work is there happening in the background. It's like the, the humming of, of an engine that is sort of somewhere there in, in the background and keep, 
keeps things running. And those things might relate to a very niche technical area, but nonetheless one that is important. And all of that effort is underwritten by committed people in the secretariat of those organizations and also outside experts they bring in. There are uh, an inordinate numbers of consultations that happen with states that are interested in the subject matter, the states that might benefit from it. And so it really gave me a glimpse, I think, at the back end of the processes that happen in international organizations. And that was a fascinating experience. And of course, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, there are political sensitivities that um, I, of course, with my peripheral involvement was insulated from. But each of those organizations needs to figure out what is within their ambit. How do they make sure that they don't step out of that remit as understood by the members? How do they make sure they don't upset any of the members? But, you know, as long as they operate within those parameters, there's a lot of boring, humdrum, technocratic work that, that happens there. Um, and so I suppose that was my takeaway from my involvement. Great, thank you, Anton, for that. Um, we have another question that we were going to use if time permits, but I'm not sure if um, you were given this beforehand. So it can, if you don't have an answer, that is also okay. Um, what international law issues do you think require more attention? Um, yeah, Natina, if you're nodding. Yeah. Um... I, as in, I think I um, implied that earlier. I do think that the fact that we live in a can in a world of technically sovereign equals, who, however, use only a handful of currencies in their international transactions and for their reserves is I think something that I'm becoming increasingly interested in because you know if you see something like 80% of transactions happen in dollars and in euros right uh, so how fully sovereign and equal can we say Australia, let alone Nepal um, or Argentina are, if they have to rely on other states that perhaps their interests don't fully align with in order to have reserves or to um or to um clear international payments is what we're teaching you a little bit of law in the books, but law in the real world. Um, undermines what we teach you um, <laughs> in, um, in class. And I think more generally for me, um, I'm just very, very interested in leaving behind a very abstract way of thinking about international law. So thinking only about rights in general, in just thinking about, let's say, each rule or each institution or each treaty, what sort of interests in the world does it help and what sort of interests does it undermine? Who gets more resources thanks to some rules of international law? Who gets perhaps cut off, right? So the typical example of that would be the debate which happened mostly a year ago, but I think it will keep coming up of whether we have gotten right the balance between intellectual property for pharmaceuticals on the one hand and people's right to access vaccines or cures uh, for curable diseases on the other, right? We came up with the answer to this balance in the 90s, but I think you see more and more um, people in countries questioning whether we got this balance right, especially, of course, in a world when suddenly we realized um, that global pandemics are on the table and that we as you know, humanity uh, only are as vulnerable as the most vulnerable, right? Um, in a sense, if people remain unvaccinated, 
um, everyone is in one way or another in danger. So for me, these are two issues um, of great legal importance, but also broadly uh, of, of political and economic importance. Hey, great. Thank you for those. Um, Anton, if you had, Addy, had anything to add? I, I have a wholly self-serving answer, which is that international law of financial crime is woefully underexplored. And it's something that I talk about to, to, you know, other people working in this area, you know, the two and a half people all, all the time, because if you look at current developments, it's actually shocking how much is happening, how important it is, how geographically widespread it is. So currently the Australian government is consulting on, for example, extending anti-money laundering obligations to lawyers, accountants, estate agents. The US government has just published an assessment of financial crime risks in decentralized virtual asset um, applications. The European Union is consulting, well, in fact, has uh, announced the um, expansion of criminalization of sanctions evasion. Um, that, that's just a smattering of things that have been happening over the past couple of months. Um, over the past couple of years, banks in a number of jurisdictions have been fined literally billions of dollars for financial crime violations and sanctions evasion. And the list goes on and on. Now, if I asked you, have you heard about the International Criminal Court? Uh, you know, all of you would say, yes, of course. Now, if I asked, uh, you know, maybe you or maybe the people who are watching this recording, have you heard about the Financial Action Task Force? Uh, probably the number of people who would say yes is much, much smaller. Yet it is an organization that affects really our daily lives in a profound manner. And so it seems to me that for some curious uh, reasons, there are areas of international law that attract a lot of attention. Um, and it's it's a sort of self-sustaining virtuous circle. And there are areas of international law, but that hasn't happened so far. And I think the area that I've just outlined is one of those. But anecdotally from, uh, you know, going to a, a major international law conference that Dina was also at um, a couple of months ago, there does seem to be growing interest in matters of sanctions and financial crime. And so I think that for someone who is an, in a position of being uh, a law student, that is potentially an interesting area. And it is an area where you could end up working in uh, government in those matters or in a uh, bank or an international organization. So I, I think, you know, there are probably areas like this sort of pockets of, uh, where, where there are pockets of expertise that are going to be growing. And I think one of the really rewarding things in your international law career is to identify one of those things that you are really interested in and then see that area develop and get the opportunity to be, you know, in a sense, part of those developments, or at least track them as they unfold. Great, thank you. That was an amazing answer. Um, um, thank you both so much. Those are the questions ILS have prepared. And now we have some time for Q&A. Um, please use the raise your hand function if you have a question for either or both of the panelists. That's okay, Tina. Um, Shashwat, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, um, I was thinking about, you know, um, Anton, about your conversation about financial crime, and you mentioned uh, virtual assets. Um, and this is uh, something that's a new emerging area of, you know, virtual assets, and you have crypto and, and whatnot. And, you know, a very interesting area of financial crime. Um, what are your thoughts on international law responding to to crimes related to particularly new technology methods, you know, crypto and virtual assets? Do you think international law is sufficiently responding to it? Yeah, look, this is a fascinating uh, question. And uh, uh, there are, I suppose, a couple of layers uh, to that. So internationally, there are very broad obligations that um, states bear under, for example, the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the UN Convention Against Corruption. 
And among other things, they need to establish adequate regulatory and supervisory regimes for the prevention of money laundering. Money laundering keeps evolving. And what that means is that in order to comply with that obligation, you continuously need to assess the risks that you are facing. And then you need to, you know, in a sense, it's like building a plane while you're mid-flight. You know, you're, you're, you're supposed to constantly keep adapting to, to this threat uh, from uh, various criminal groups, uh, corrupt dictators, and so on. Now, how do states do that? Well, that happens through the intermediation of various institutions that sort of help them and guide their efforts. The most important one is the one that I've mentioned a couple of times already, the Financial Action Task Force, which is a grouping of 30 odd countries that adopts financial crime standards and then countries are supposed to implement that. And that organization proved to be remarkably agile when virtual assets emerged. So, um, you know, depending on how you count, I suppose Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies got really mainstream around 2013, 2014, uh, maybe 2015. And then already by 2018, the Financial Action Task Force had recommendations in place that countries need to implement in terms of regulating virtual asset service providers. And um, a lot of work in that area is happening at the domestic level as well in places like the US, UK, Australia. So it is a very fast moving area. And I think it would be mistaken to think that just because it's new, um, international law is failing to adapt to that. It is adapting, but not through things like, you know, all 180 plus states parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption getting together and changing it, but through those, I would say, sort of second layer institutions, somewhat underneath the surface, like the Financial Action Task Force, Interpol, Europol, um, an organization that brings together government entities known as financial intelligence units around the world, and so on. So that's the way that the international community, um, if not international law, is responding to that. Hey, great, thank you. Um, did anyone else have any questions? Or Shash, what were you going to say something? No, 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 I was just saying thank you, Anton. Perfectly amazing response. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, Rafi, if that's how you... Okay. Uh, thank you to both of the panelists and to ILS for organizing. I don't have an international law question per se, but a question uh, crossed my mind when you were, were talking about your scholarly publications. Do you, do both of you have any advice on to like junior or aspiring scholars about how to build uh, an original voice or an original take on things? Um, because I, I follow Professor Zuvala on Twitter and I remember that your theoretical framework you said was informed by watching films. I'm not sure if, I'm, if I imagine that, but I'm wondering if you can uh, elaborate on both of your processes and any advice you may be able to share. Shall I, because Anton took the previous one. <laughs> So I think um, one way to, to, to start developing original voice is, of course, to start writing about things you care about, right? About things that during your studies, during your extracurriculars, during, you know, your time as an active citizen have, have drawn your, your, your attention, right? Um, so I think being, at least in the beginning, driven by genuine interest rather than this thing that Anton said, you know, the demand-based publication. I think in the beginning, there is merit in doing a little bit the former, um, the, the passion-driven publication or the interest-driven publication than the latter. So that would be, um, that would be the one thing. The second thing counterintuitively is I think the only two ways in order to write well is to write a lot, just keep writing. And it's also to read and to read a lot as a writer. And for example, try to think 
if there is a legal scholar or let's say a scholar of international relations or um, of political economy, whatever it is that interests you, that you find the writing very compelling to just start thinking and noticing when you read them, what it is about the writing that you find compelling or what do you think it is that makes it really accessible, really elegant or whatever add an adjective there and that doesn't necessarily mean that you should mimic them but I think you should put care into into your writing I don't think that writing is incidental to our ideas I think writing is how our ideas exist they don't exist outside um either us talking about them or writing about them so I would say putting care into your writing and thinking about it not as a drug that you have to do in order to communicate but as where your ideas live um can can go a very long way into curating your own voice and I think also the other thing is to just kill forever the idea that there is people who are just good at writing and people who are just not that good at writing. As I was saying before, I think this is something that you can improve and your writing style can and will change if you write a lot, not suddenly, you know, <laughs> for no obvious reason. Um, so I think it like, as with everything, Treat writing as something that you can learn and as something that you can improve or something that can get worse if you don't uh, put care into it. Can I just add, add to that very quickly? I think, you know, the, you know, for me, the greatest evolution that I've undergone so far in my writing was in my previous job. At some point, I had a realization oh my God, when I write something, there's a chance that people will actually read it. And that sort of disciplines you. And and it's it's both very rewarding because you, you suddenly start feeling that you're not just, you know, writing um, something into the void that will never be seen. It's it's rewarding to know that even if it's a very small number of readers, you know, there, there's someone out there who might find it interest interesting. And then that helps you focus on that audience right with them in mind it also i think makes you a nicer writer you're unlikely to be wantonly and unnecessarily critical of others if you you know take that approach that people will actually read it and so i think there, there's a number of benefits to having that mindset okay i'm writing this thing and there might be you know an audience for it and i'm writing with that audience in mind and i think that that generally is a good approach to to writing that that's helped me a lot. Okay, great. Thank you both for your advices and Rafi for your question. Um, I think that may be all the questions, unless anyone had some extra ones. No? Um, great. So thank you both for your time and expert opinions tonight. The ILS is very appreciative of your presence and like what you've shared with us tonight. And thank you, Rafi, for coming. And thank you for people who are watching. Well, this is posted later. Um, thank you guys so much. And Thanks. just just I quickly could add a couple of sort of closing remarks. Um, I think the great thing about this chat is we, I think, got a couple of things. Number one, both of you are so passionate. And I think that's something that we really value as students. You know, it's one thing, obviously, to have great researchers and academics teaching us, but also when we see that passion from your voice, um, and your the way you deliver your content, I think that excites all of us as students. Um, so thank you for for that, and also thank you for making um your content really accessible, um, in terms of you know, how your answers are so encouraging and motivating. You know, there's no one set standard of writing or one set sort of getting into this profession or one set of you know gaining knowledge. I think it's it's as students, it's very important for us to remember that you know um it's a slow process and there's no one way of doing things um we will get there 
And I think it's conversations like these when academics like you make time for us, it's um, that these gateway of this knowledge gaps are bridged. Um, so thank you once again for coming and chatting with us. Um, and we hope to engage with you once again sometime later in the year. ILS had a great run of events, social and academic and career events this semester. This is the last semester. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And um, once again, um, panelists, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. That was really fun.